Recording. Recording. Okay. So guys, here's the deal. And in retrospect, this is turning out well. Um, because had we not had whatever we want to call Tuesday, the best day of my life or the train wreck that that turned into or something in between. Um, but guys, honestly, can I tell you the coolest thing for me that came out of Tuesday's conversation was the number of you that approached me either personally or digitally and said, check this out. It was really cool. Matt shared a ton of really neat videos with me, and I think you were going to but didn't or something. But guys, it was, it was really interesting. The number of, it, it, it's cool to know that you guys think about this stuff too. And you think about it enough that you're actually actively pursuing it and, and you're sharing with me while I'm sharing with you, which was really neat. I, that was cool, so thank you. Um, but guys, with that said, regardless of where you are relative to the muckiness, literally, that is, um, that is, that is quantum mechanics, guys, together we need to understand at least this. You ready? Electrons do not behave as particles. What do they do? And it's all over the place. They appear, they disappear, they reappear. They travel between spaces without crossing the intervening space. They can travel from A to B and travel through all the possible spaces in between. They, they, guys, they, they can appear in every possible location at once, or they can be in none of these locations ever. So guys, we understand that fundamentally electrons behave in ways that we don't understand. We can't predict. And guys, that is the important concept that we need to build on is this idea of unpredictability. And so the idea is that if we let go of Bohr and if we say, okay, Heisenberg, we get it. We can't know where an electron is, and we can't know where an electron's going. And you guys remember that concept? It's not in the notes, but it is on the AP test. Should we go over it again? The Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Write it down. If you don't know it, write it down. So guys, Heisenberg is the person that got us to finally think about the idea that electrons are not particles. And he didn't do it by saying initially electrons are not particles. What he did do is he said, if we try to study electrons like particles, we are doomed to failure. And here's why. Heisenberg took Bohr's data. And as he started to analyze it, what he started to understand was that every time we tried to clearly define where an electron was, we couldn't tell where it was going. And every time we tried to clearly define where an electron was going, we couldn't tell where it was. He said it this way. He said that you can never know the exact position and momentum of an electron. Position is where it is and momentum is where it's going. How much of that do I need to say again? So Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you okay with that? And it simply says this, you can never know the exact position and momentum of an electron you can't, at the same time. And it's actually interesting because what he showed was that the more exactly you knew one, the less exactly you would know the other. It was like a seesaw. If you knew position really well, you couldn't tell momentum. And if you knew momentum really well, you couldn't tell position. So guys, you tell me, did he, did, is that enough of that? Is that okay? Do you have enough time to write down what you want to write down? Go ahead. So it's momentum. Is that like saying, okay, I know I'm going to be here at some point? Is that saying, okay? No, it, it, no, no, no. And that's exactly the point. Jake said this. He said, does that mean, are we talking about knowing where an electron will be at some point? Could I add in time? At some point in time. And that's not what Bohr was trying to do. He wasn't trying to say it will be here sometime. He was trying to say it's there right now. 
And the difference here, guys, is the fundamental ways that electrons behave. So let's talk about the why of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So why can't we know where an electron is and where it's going? And the answer is because it isn't anywhere. Electrons don't have position, and we're not going to get all crazy about this, but guys, electrons don't have position until you look for them. And before that happens, instead of position, we talk, as your brain was going, Jake, about the idea of probability. So let's do this in our brains. Because guys, here's the deal. Electrons do not have fixed positions and paths in space. Electrons have volumes where they will probably be found. Do you see the distinction? No, 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 no. That's, don't go back to Heisenberg. Just go forward with me. It's not the momentum. So here's the idea. Electrons do not have places and paths. Because in order to have, oh, four Ps, you ready? Because three Ps. Because in order to have places and paths, you have to be a particle. And electrons do not have places and paths. And how do we know? Because if an electron had a place and a path, we would know its position and its momentum. And Heisenberg showed that we couldn't. And because Heisenberg showed that we can't know position and momentum, we understood that place and path made no sense. And so they had to let go of place and path because that's not what electrons do. So what was the P that replaced it? Probability. And this is the idea, and this is where Schrodinger made his money, if you will. Schrodinger said this, we can't know where an electron is and where it's going because that's unknowable because electrons are not particles. So let's rethink the way we think about electrons and let's not treat them as particles, let's treat them as waves. And as soon as we treat them as waves, we can then talk about the volumes where these electrons will probably be. Do you see the distinction? Okay, now here's the magic part. What do those volumes, where the electrons can probably be, what do those volumes look like? Waves. Do you see it? So guys, here's the progression of thought. Bohr particles. Particles don't work because electrons don't behave like particles. Heisenberg proved it by saying we can't know where they are and where they're going. So Schrodinger came along and said, okay, let's let go of particles and let's come up with a new way of thinking about electrons. And he suggested let's treat electrons like waves. And it turns out that his thought was brilliant because it turns out that electrons do behave like waves and there are volumes where those electrons will probably be and the boundaries of those volumes look like waves. Yeah. I love that you're looking up there. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. No. No, it is a wavy circle. And so understand that the minute we start talking about waves, I wonder if I can do this. Let's see how good I am with my, with my laser. So as soon as we start talking about waves, we no longer have tightly defined boundaries. We have wiggly boundaries that are, am I doing okay? That are actually more wave-like. So the bound, and you guys understand this is the 1S sublevel. We'll talk more in a minute. But this 1S sublevel does not have a clearly defined boundary. It has a wave-like boundary, and within that space, not just on that circle, but within that volume is the place where those two electrons will most likely be found, the space of highest probability. Now understand that doesn't mean that it is there. It could be other places. 
But guys, in this, we're not gonna do too much of this. Understand that technically, the only time that electron actually behaves as if it is there is when we look for it. And I know that that sounds weird and we're not gonna do a lot with it, but we need to get comfortable with this idea that electrons are actually probabilities. And we describe these volumes where they will probably be as if they are spheres and figure eights and clover leaves and things like that. Because in fact, that is the place where these electrons will most likely be as they go in and out of existence, moving through these volumes, creating clouds that are actually behave as if they're solids because those electrons can literally be everywhere within those volumes simultaneously. Crazy, right? But guys, that's where these pictures come from. Where we, where we, when we, when we start to do, did I play with this one last time? Let's play with it again. So the idea is this one. When we start to talk about this idea that there are little spheres and bigger spheres and these things that we call dumbbells, what these are, are these are actually the wave-like, remember, because you can picture a wave going around the boundary. These are the wave-like volumes, and these should be three-dimensional, right? It's not a circle, it's a sphere. These are the wave-like volumes where these electrons will probably be found. Found. And the first two electrons will probably be found in this small spherical space. And then the next two electrons are found in a larger spherical space. And then the next six electrons are found in three spaces that look like figure eights. Again, they're three dimensional. One's oriented up and down, one left and right, one in and out. These are called what? The P orbitals, right? And then we go back to spherical spaces and then bigger dumbbells and then bigger spherical spaces and then we get the D's and these things are all messed up and it just goes on from there. But guys, these volumes are actually the wave-like shapes and you're going, wait, that doesn't look like a wave. Remember the wave defines the boundary of that space. These wave-like spaces that describe where electrons will probably be found. Go ahead. Ooh, ooh, sort of dimpled. Wow, Mark, I'd never thought about it that way, but I'm going to in the future. That's interesting. Yeah, that you, you have a surface that is dimpled, wave-like. I like that. Yeah, I, that, that feels good to me. Yeah, go ahead, James. So is there, I mean, the, the probability is going to be in there. Yes. Uh, no, what's, no. What's, what we assign, mm -hmm. okay, this is what probability is. Yeah, and it's funny because if you look this up in a, in a high school chemistry book, I wonder if it even says in our book, they typically throw out the number 90%. Um, does our book throw out anything? You don't need to look. I'll look for us. Um, look at me go. Um, stairs and a ramp. Oh, electrons as waves, uncertainty principle, quantum mechanics. Typically, they hide these numbers in diagrams. Um, I know that when I used to teach out of a general chemistry book for my other classes, they used to say 90%. Um, these but 90% was a sort of an arbitrary number. I think in a more advanced textbook, they actually even shy away from any number at all. Oh, wait, here we go. Um, frankly, I'd be surprised if they try to give it a percentage. Yeah, it's, yes. And, it, and, it, so it, and so maybe you could think about it that way. It's really a probability curve. And the peak of that curve defines the boundary of the space. Um, so, yeah. How do we determine the shape of the orbital? 
Yeah, good question. So, so, so no. So remember that how, guys, and that's actually, we're going to use that question as our transitioning thought. So how did we come up with the shapes of these orbitals, the S, the P's, the D's, the F's? And guys, understand that the shapes of these orbitals were originally proposed by Heisen, or by Schrodinger, completely mathematically. He took equations that, that had been been robustly developed for waves, like waves in water and waves in other media. And he took those wave equations and applied them to, to charged particles, electrons. And the as, as he graphed, if you will, as he took these equations that describe waves and as he graphed them, he found that if he put a a, um, a certain combination of values in for the variables, the graph was a sphere. And then if you put other values in for the variables, you got a figure eight, oriented up and down. And then if you changed one of those variables, you got a figure eight that was horizontal. And if you changed another variable, you got a figure eight that this was this way. So all of these S's and P's and D's and F's were actually just the graphs of the equations given different variable values that, that Schrodinger was using in his equations. So the question, and did you guys catch that? Because that's important, did you? Okay, so what then are those variables? Well guys, that's these. Those variables in Schrodinger's equations are N, L, M, and S. So do this with me, you ready? Just see if this works. N is the principal quantum number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, P, or I'm sorry, L is the sublevel number. S, P, D, and F. But it turns out that they actually have numerical equivalents. S is zero, P is one, D is two, and F is three. Then guys, you've got the orbital number, um, which goes from negative L to positive L. We'll talk more about that later. And then you've got the spin number up and down. So you ready for this? Do this with me. If you plug a one in for N, that would be first energy level. If you plug a zero in for L, Zero is the S sublevel. So now we're talking about 1S. Then if you plug a zero in for M, which is the orbital number, and then if you plug in plus one half or minus one half for S and graph it, guess what you get? A little ball. Now what happens if you do this? What if you put in two for N? Well, you're now in the second energy level. And what happens if you put in one for L? That's actually the P. And then what happens if you put in negative one for M? Well, it turns out negative one indicates the Z axis. And then what happens if you put in plus or minus one for S and graph it? You get a figure eight that is oriented on the Z axis. And then what happens if you go two and one and zero, and then plus or minus one half. Then it turns this way. And then what happens if you go two and one and positive one and plus or minus one half? Then it goes, which one didn't I do? I forget. But, but guys, the idea here is that all of these shapes are the graphs of the wave equations using these variables to fill in the equations. So initially, all of this was mathematical, and then we were later able to do experiments that went back in and have very richly supported what the math initially proposed. It's crazy stuff. So guys, here's what we're gonna do today. By the way, does anyone need one of these? Did y'all have them? Um, make it gentle, because we're about to go forward. So um, if this is, if these are just based off of mathematical models, couldn't you then, I mean, it's a way, couldn't you then get a number, at least from your model, like about what the probability is this going to be? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, de no, no, no. So, okay, so we didn't answer your question. So you asked the question, what's the probability? Um, definitely. Yeah, and okay, so don't go here with me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a reference to look at, and then you can uh, go here at your leisure. Um, 
you're gonna want to go and look at at 220 at page 223 and it on at the top of page 223 it talks about the relationship between waves and shapes and probability and uh, take a look at that it I think it'll answer your questions okay all right so guys here's then what we're gonna do let's re-familiarize ourselves with energy level sublevel orbital spin you ready and guys I'll throw this up on the board as we go so here is what you need to either learn again or remember. So guys, when we describe electrons, we need four numbers to describe the volumes that they occupy. The first number is what is called the principal quantum number n. That tells you the size of the cloud. Remember on our periodic table, this ranges from one to seven, remember? So energy level one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Remember that? Okay. Now, guys, we also talked last year about the capacity of an energy level. You found out that it's predicted by the 2n squared rule. Do you remember how this works or do we need to talk about it? Okay, so in the first energy level, plugging in one for n, in the first energy level, one squared is one times two is two. How many electrons can be in the first energy level? Two. Then, guys, the second energy level, two squared is four times two is eight. So there can be eight electrons in the second energy level. You may remember that two are in the S and six are in the P. Remember that? Now, the third energy level, three squared is nine times two is 18. So there can be 18 electrons in the third energy level. Where are they? Two in the S, six in the P, 10 in the D. Remember that? Is it sort of coming back to you? And it, and it builds up from there. And so this then allows you to predict how many electrons can be in an energy level. Doesn't mean there are, they don't have to be full, but it's the maximum capacity. Then guys, we learn some things about N. We learn this, as N goes up, the size gets bigger. And we know that, right? We've got a little circle and a bigger circle and a bigger, they get bigger, right? But we also learned this, check this out. As N goes up, as N goes up, the energy goes up to a maximum of what? Zero, Zero. remember? So we've got energy levels going like this. Oh, don't do that. We've got energy levels going like this. And we know that this is the first energy level, the second, the third, the fourth. We've got negative R sub H divided by N squared. And when we plug in the numbers for N, these numbers get less and less and less negative to a maximum of zero. And when this number hits zero, the electron's not associated to the nucleus. And what do we call the amount of energy that it takes to get it there? Ionization energy, yeah? All right. And then guys, we also know that the capacity increases and that's the two N squared rule. You good on that? Okay. Now guys, here's the trick. This is everything that Bohr knew. Bohr knew about energy levels. He knew about capacity. He knew about energies. He's the one that came up with these ideas and it doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it incomplete. So guys, all of this stuff is the Bohr model of the atom. But if you leave it there, then your atoms have got to be spherical. You, I'm sorry, your energy levels have got to be spherical. Um, and when the Bohr model fell apart, thanks to Heisenberg, well, it wasn't Heisenberg that destroyed the Bohr model. The Bohr model was fundamentally wrong, and Heisenberg showed it. But then along came Schrodinger and he said, okay, these electrons are not in clearly defined circular orbits. They're doing something more complex than that. And so what Schrodinger did is he took the N value, if you will, from Bohr and used it in these wave equations. 
But if you are going to describe more complex systems, not just spheres, if you're going to describe systems that are more complex, you need more variables. So it turned out that the first variable that Schrodinger included, he called the sublevel quantum number. He realized that these energy levels that Bohr envisioned as being spherical actually were not necessarily spherical. They had different shapes. Understand that they were also probabilities and not paths, but these areas of probability have different shapes. And he used a variable to describe these shapes the sublevel quantum number. And what he, as he was developing this idea, what he showed was this. The number of sublevels in an energy level is N. Do you remember what that means? Okay, so let's talk about it. How many energy levels do we have? Seven, right? One through seven. There's seven shells in our universe. So guys, we've got seven potential shells. The first shell can contain how many sublevels? One. We learned later it was an S. The second energy level can contain how many sublevels? Two, S and P. The third energy level can have three, SPD. The fourth can have four, SPDF. How many sublevels can the fifth energy level have? Five, S, P, D, F. What's the fifth one? They actually say that they will, they, they have ident, they call it the G sublevel. And guys, you can actually Google and look up the shapes of the G sublevel. Now, is there a G sublevel for our universe? No, we don't need one. We don't need the capacity that is provided by a G sublevel. But guys, we can show you what they look like because it's just math. We can plug in phi for L and graph it. So you can actually look up the theoretical shapes for the G sublevel. Again, we don't have an, and I actually proposed this once to, I did this for extra credit. Which element would be the first atom that required to, play, to place an electron in the G sublevel? I don't think it is. Yeah, it's harder than that. Yeah, no, that, yeah, no, that's a whole different thing. So, all right, so guys, you okay with sublevel? and realize that for us with sublevel, we call this S, P, D, and F. If you're curious, we didn't talk about this last year. These letters are actually uh, uh, not acronyms, uh, abbreviations. Um, these were abbreviations for the words that Schrodinger was using to describe these spaces. It stands for simple, primary, diffuse, and fundamental. Um, I don't know why he chose those words, but he did. Uh, Oh, is it sharp? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh, you see, I learned it as simple. You read sharp. And it's, you see, I never knew how he came up with the words, but you're saying it's a description of the light. That's cool. I didn't know that. That's cool. But it is sharp, principal, diffuse, and... Interesting. I didn't know that. Okay, so, but guys, again, understand that S, P, D, and F are actually numbers. I used to have to teach this to you in AP, but they got rid of it in 2014. But technically, S is zero, P is one, D is two, F is three. You don't need to know that in AP anymore. Okay, but then guys, what we found out is that these sublevels, S, P, D, and F, are actually still broken into smaller spaces. That, that these, these sublevels are broken down into orbitals. And so Schrodinger needed a variable to describe these orbitals, and he, he used this, this variable m. This is the orbital quantum number. Now guys, the, the orbital quantum number actually tells you orientation. So let me sort of explain. I should just get this down. I don't up here enough. Why don't I just do that? Okay. So guys, the trick here 
is that the sub or the orbital quantum number tells you orientation. So for example, in a P sublevel, you can see that there's a vertical or horizontal and then a Z orientation, right? So how many different orbital values would you expect for the P sublevel? Three. You don't need to know this anymore, but I'll just tell you their values are negative one, zero, and one. No. And let's talk about it. So guys, what about the S sublevel? There is, so the, the value for the orbital number in the S sublevel is zero. Why would that be? Because spheres don't have orientation. Spheres don't have up, down, left, and right. They're kind of spheres. So guys, we don't, and understand that it doesn't mean there is no value. It means the value is zero because spheres have zero orientation. So then if we get to the D sublevel, how many D, how many D orbitals are there? There are five. So how many values would you expect there to be for M? Five. And guys, if you're curious, the values are negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. So the idea here then is that we need a number that describes the orientation of these orbitals. That number called the orbital quantum number allows you to distinguish between up, down, left, and right if it's the P's and so on. So from there then we understand that Practically, what each one of these orbitals is, is a space that two electrons can occupy. But then, guys, we get into this problem. Electrons are negative, right? And so we just said that in an orbital, two electrons pair up. How can that be? They're spins. So I know that you have at least heard of this, but let's talk about it. So, guys, the idea is this. To understand spin... Think about electrons like little Earths. And the Earth has a North Pole and the Earth has a South Pole, right? So do electrons. Electrons are polar. They not only have an electrical component, they have a magnetic component, electromagnetism. They have a magnetic component. And it turns out that when two electrons pair up, one of them will actually flip over so that they are oriented north pole to south pole so that they, it, it creates a partial attraction that overcomes the repulsion between the electrons. So we can't see electrons, right? So how do we know that these electrons are, organized, are, are orienting in this fashion? And here's how, here's how you know. Uh, oh boy. Electrons spin. Electrons spin, and they all, and, and, and so the trick is, is that if an, I'm going to hurt myself, if an electron flips over, so, <laughs> is that right? I think it's right. So does its, or so does the direction of its spin. And so guys, it turns out that we can tell which direction the north pole of an electron is pointing because when things with charge spin, they create current. And if an electron is north pole up, it'll create a current that flows in one direction. And if it's north pole down, it creates a current that flows in another direction. And if we stick electrons in magnetic fields, we can actually detect which way their north poles are pointing because we can detect which way they're spinning. And that's why we call it spin. Spin is actually a word that we give to describe the fact that electrons, when they pair up, orient with opposite excuse me, orient with opposite poles. Get the idea? Okay. And then, guys, relative to numbers, um, Schrodinger gave these things the values for plus one-half or minus one-half. Now, guys, this is where things get a little, a little funky because we say up and down. We say spin up is plus one-half and spin down is minus one-half. You understand that's stupid, right? In the world of the subatomic, there is no point of reference around which we can say this is up and this is down. It's an electron, right? You don't Because when we say up and down, we talk about relative to the Earth. So that's up 
and this is down, but that's because we've got this big old rock we're floating around on, and we define that as down going towards the earth. Guys, in an atom, there is no frame of reference for up and down. So we arbitrarily say up and down, but what we're really saying is opposite. You get the idea? Okay. All right. So, guys, there you have it. Here's all this quantum craziness that Schrodinger brought in to the equation, if you will. So how does that then change the way that we understand what electrons look like, if you will? Guys, don't try to write this down. Just enjoy. Did I ever tell you my experience when I first started teaching this stuff? This is funny. I, I really want to explain to you where this came from. Um, here's the scoop. So I'm somewhat fresh out of college. My brain is full of ideas. I'm, uh, you know, I'm 25, 26 years old. I start teaching and I realized that I had a lot to learn. And so like an idiot, I figured the best way to learn how to be a better chemistry teacher would be to associate with other chemistry teachers. Uh, you quickly find out there are some really bad chemistry teachers out there. So I joined, imagine the fun of this, a high school chemistry teacher chat group. It's as bad as it sounds. Um, Although it was really eye-opening because there were a couple other Utah County teachers that were a part of this chat group, and it was really interesting. I'm like 25 years old, right? And I'm wet behind the ears and easily intimidated, and there are, all, there are a couple of teachers here in the valley that, I mean, they're on this chat group just thumping their chest. Listen to me, I'm amazing, da 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 This is how the real men teach chemistry and you do this and that and over here. And frankly, I felt like an idiot. I'm like, dang, this guy's good and I got nothing and oh, I better go bow at his. I mean, it was really a humiliating, intimidating experience. And then I started going to district science meetings and I met these people. And first of all, they're jerks. And then, I started talking with their students. I wasn't living in Orem High School boundaries, and I started meeting some of the students of these guys that are chest pounding on the internet, and their students hate them, and they're all failing the AP test. It was, I, you know how they say that, that you can be whoever you want online? Oh boy, it was really funny. So, but anyway, so guys, the story then goes, so I'm in this chat group and I'm a little freaked out. And then October, right? November. And it's, it's time to start teaching quantum theory. Most high school AP classes are moving at the, or general chemistry even, are moving at the same pace. I'm teaching this to my general class right now as well. Remember, we did that last year in November. Anyway, so, and, and it was, all of a sudden the talk in this chat group turned to quantum theory. And then we came to find out that there was a Princeton University professor that was snooping this chat group. And when, we when high school teachers started talking about teaching quantum theory, um, this university professor all of a sudden inserted himself into the conversation. And, and this was his advice. He said to high school chemistry teachers, high school chemistry teachers, have no business teaching quantum theory. Your students are too stupid to understand it. You're not good enough to teach it. Skip it and let us do it at the university level when we can do it right. Don't ever tell me what I can't do. I got pissed. I, I wanted to like buy a ticket to Princeton and go beat this guy. I'm like, bring it on, buddy. Uh-uh, don't ever tell me what I can't do. And uh, guys, it fired me up. I'm like, it's game on. Not only am I gonna figure out how to teach this stuff, I'm gonna teach this in a way that my kids are gonna understand it. And uh, that's what led to this. 
So if you had me last year, you've seen this before. If you didn't and had Miss Call, I know that you've seen this because we were teaching very tightly together. If you had Mr. Hart, I frankly don't know if you've seen this because Hart was real distracted with bunches of other things. Not that that made him a bad chemistry teacher. I just didn't have the chance to collaborate with him as closely. So he may not have done this. But guys, here's what we're gonna do. You ready? This is cool. We are going to take this and we're gonna turn it into this. You ready? Here's how this goes. So guys, here we've got down here at the bottom, the nucleus of an atom. Now, in addition to that, what we've got is we've got these rungs of the ladder. Now guys, what do the rungs of this ladder represent? The answer is the energy levels. And so what we do is we understand that these energy levels are numbered by the, the number N. But then, guys, moving left to right across the paper, we've got L, which you understand to be the sublevel number, S, P, D, and F. And then we've got M, which is the orbital number, which describes the spaces that two electrons actually occupy. We understand that they look like clouds, and those are the volumes of highest probability of finding the electron. You good with those ideas? Okay, so let's do this. Guys, what are the values for the first four energy levels? Well, really simply, they're just one, two, three, and four, right? Understand that it does go up to seven, but I couldn't fit this on the slide. But let's see, I don't know if you know this or not. Guys, this is not drawn to scale. If it were drawn to scale, how would the drawing change? Yeah, the nucleus would actually be down on the second floor. Okay, understand, guys, that the first energy level is not tucked up against the nucleus. Guys, the nucleus, it might even be to scale down like in the lobby. Um, this is not drawn to scale. There's a lot of empty space between the first energy level and the nucleus. They're not tucked up against each other. But obviously, if I did that, it wouldn't fit on the screen. So, but guys, what about this relative spacing? Good or bad? Good. Guys, it turns out that the energy levels, let me say that differently, the space between the energy levels are getting progressively tighter together. If you're not sure why, think about, think about it this way. Instead of thinking about this as an energy or as a distance diagram, think about it as an energy diagram. I can say this to you and I couldn't have said this last year. How do we calculate the energies of these energy levels? Negative R sub H divided by what? N squared. You are squaring the value of the denominator and that squaring of the divisor, the denominator, would indicate to you that these are getting closer together because you're dividing by the square of one and then two, which is four, and then three, which is nine, and then four, which is 16. And so because the denominator is increasing as a squared relationship, in fact, the energies and the distances are not linear, linearly decreasing. It's actually, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, what's that called? Parab Say it again. Exponential relationship, yeah. It would what? If we're thinking about the yes. No, 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 no. So, so understand that n equals zeros up here. Wait, no. Let me say that. Oh, wait, wait. Hold on. No, no, no. I'm sorry. E equals zero is up here when n goes to infinity. N doesn't go to zero. There is no zero energy level. We like to call it the middle. No, but seriously, that's true. Because remember, when we're talking about energy levels, we're talking about electrons. And the nucleus is not an electron-possessing thing. So the nucleus is our, 
is our point of reference, and these numbers represent energies relative to the nucleus, but that doesn't mean we need to assign a number to the nucleus, because the nucleus is not an electron possessing object. It is simply the middle of the atom about which we define these energies. So it's our zero point, but that doesn't mean that n is zero. Is that okay? It's really just, I'm, I'm scrambling, I'm, I'm fear to say this out loud because this could be horrible, but I'm going to do it anyway. What, let's try this and if it fails, it fails. But what if, what if you think about it in terms of gravity? Because these are potential energies, right? What if you think about it in terms of gravity? Well, the reason that, that we have some potential energy here, but more potential energy here, is because it's relative to the Earth. But when we, when we quantify how much energy this book has, we do it based upon a measurement. We're a meter above the ground, which is analogous with some amount of potential energy. Now we're two meters above the ground, which is analogous to some amount of energy. So this would be one meter elevation, this would be two meter elevation. We would call the ground zero, but that doesn't mean the ground is a book. It means the ground is simply our point of reference against which we are measuring the energies of other objects relative to that point. That went a lot better than I thought it would. I was really hesitant, but I think the analogy is pretty good. Is that helpful? Okay. Are we, are we okay? All right. So now, guys, check this out. We are now, given what we've got, going to populate this entire page. So, guys, first thing we're going to do, and you understand these are the rungs of the ladder. Do you understand, though, that this is actually a core sample out of an atom? I'll draw this in quickly, but what we're actually looking at is like the first, the second, the third, and the fourth energy levels, right? And they're actually three-dimensional spheres. Okay. All right, so guys, with that said, let's first of all figure out how many electrons can be in these energy levels. So what equation predicts their capacities? 2n squared. So this would be, oh, hold on, I'm not in clicky mode. This would be 2, 4, I'm sorry, 8. 18 and 32. 2n squared rule? Okay. So now, guys, let's do this. Let's go from energy levels to sublevels. So how many sublevels can be in an energy level? N. The first energy level has 1. What is it? S. Second, 2. S and P. Third is 3. S, P, D, and so on, right? Okay. <laughs> Chemistry cheerleader. Ready? Okay. All right. Okay. So... I can't believe I just did that publicly. <laughs> For some of you, you may never be able to get that out of your mind. Um, sorry. Okay, so guys. Oh, it's on the screencast. Okay, so guys, back, back then to this. So, first energy level, how many sublevels? One. What it, hold on, guys. What is it? It's an S. So guys, we are going to represent that for now with a line. And this is the idea. This is the first energy level, and it only contains one sublevel, and it is an S sublevel. So we think about it this way, which is weird. The first energy level, if you will, is broken into one sublevel, and it is an S sublevel. It's weird to think of it as broken into because it's only got one part, but... Now, the first energy level only has one sublevel, and or and the first energy level contains two electrons. So if the first energy level has two electrons and only an S sublevel, how many electrons have got to be in that sublevel? Both of them, two. So there's two electrons in a sublevel. If you don't understand that, think about it this way. If you've got a neighborhood, and it's like in Lehigh where they're building neighborhoods like crazy. So they come out and they define, here's the neighborhood. And let's say we're going to build two houses in that neighborhood. But it's early on and that neighborhood only has one street. 
So the neighborhood is broken into streets like energy levels are broken into sublevels. So if the neighborhood only has one street, but if the neighborhood has two houses, how many houses have got to be on that street? Both of them because there's nowhere else to put them because there's only one street. Now guys, similarly here, if you've got an energy level that only contains one sublevel, the neighborhood and the street, if there's two house, if there's two electrons like houses in that energy level, they both got to be on the same street. Get it? Okay, now let's go to orbitals. Guys, how many electrons can go in an orbital? Two. What is true of those two electrons? Opposite spins. So, how many orbitals does it take to house those two electrons? One. So this then is the complete logic. You ready? First energy level contains one sublevel. It is an S sublevel. That S sublevel contains one orbital because that is all that's necessary to house two electrons. And then we can talk a little bit more about this and understand that this S orbital is actually spherical, which you learned last year. Now moving on, realize guys that when we move then to the second energy level, the second energy level has how many sublevels? Two. Two, what are they? S and P. But now guys, thinking about energy, because you can do that and you couldn't do that last year, it turns out that the 2S has lower energy than the 2P. It turns out that it's not significantly less, but it is a little less. That's why the 2s fills before the 2p. Now, we've already established that there's two electrons in the s. So if there's two electrons in the s, how many have got to be in the p? Uh, it's got to be a total of eight. If two of the eight are here, how many are left for here? Six. Now, We've already established that an S or sublevel needs one orbital to hold its two electrons. So, as we would expect, the 2S sublevel contains one orbital, because that's all we need to hold two electrons, and it's a sphere. Now, guys, how is the 2S orbital different than the 1S orbital? The 2S is bigger. Now, let's talk about the orbitals in the P. How many P orbitals did there have to be? Why three? Because each holds two and we've got to have room for six. But it turns out that these P orbitals are not spherical. They are, oh gosh, I'm, I'm doing super clicks. So guys, these are not spherical. They are actually figure eight or dumbbell shaped. But now we understand, guys, that these three P orbitals are not separated. They are all gathered around the same nucleus. We've drawn them separated here for clarity. But guys, just like this, they are actually gathered around the same nucleus. So now what have we got? Well, now we have a growingly complex system where we've got two electrons in a relatively low energy spherical 1s space. Then we've got the next two electrons in a larger, higher energy spherical 2s space. And then we've got six electrons in these dumbbell shaped p orbital spaces. Now guys, we understand that the s and p are not the same shape, but how are the 2s and 2p orbitals similar? energy. They have approximately the same energy. Not exactly. The 2s is a little bit lower energy than the 2p, but they're close. So what does this look like when we bring it all together? Well, we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 electrons. That would make this neon. So what does neon look like? Guys, neon looks like this. So help us understand what we're looking at. Right, so guys, first of all, and understand this is artistic. There's all these shh. No, but I can't. What does that space represent? The 1s. Talk to me then about this bigger space. 2s, and then we've got 
the two P's. And guys, the one thing I do really like about this drawing is why is it that the 2P is a little bit bigger than the 2S? Because it's slightly higher energy. Not high enough for it to describe a new energy level, but it is slightly higher energy and therefore bigger than the other. And now we've got the 1S, the 2S, the 2P, all located around the same neon nucleus. And guys, this is a pretty good representation of what a neon atom looks like. Now, before we do questions, let's make sure we're clear on this. Does that mean that these electrons are actually moving through these spaces? No, these are simply the places where we are most likely going to find those electrons, but because they're moving freely throughout these spaces, these spaces don't behave as if they are clouds, they actually behave as if they are solid, very real things, and that's what makes us solid. Because these regions of probability, when you bring them together, create things that appear to be solid because they're, they're, they're the boundaries of where those electrons are most probably found. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Yes. But they have like a wavelength that like completes in a circle, right? Oh, well, if it's an S, if it's a P, it, it completes in a figure eight. So as it gets a higher energy level, yes. it gets bigger. Correct. Um, are the wavelengths longer? Oh, gosh. I don't remember. I, I don't recall. Um, but you're, what you're saying is right, that, that as the energy goes up, the wavelength changes, which fundamentally changes the volume of the space. So let, let's do this just really quickly. So what about this idea of wavelength? Because this is interesting because it plays two parts. Does the electron have a wavelength? Yes. And that wavelength is associated with its energy. But, and this is cool. The energy, I'm sorry, the wavelength of that electron not only describes the electron, it also describes the volume where that electron can be. So let's think about it this way. It not only describes the energy and the behavior of the electron, it also then predicts the boundary of the volume where that electron can be. And those are, that's not a coincidence, that the boundaries are defined by the wavelength of the electron. And those, you're right that those wavelengths change, but, but it provides both functions. The wavelength describes the electron and also describes where the electron can be. Now, whether those wavelengths, I don't remember, whether they get longer, I think they get shorter. Excuse me. I think they get shorter, but don't quote me on that. But it does change. Is that okay? Isn't that crazy? Um, just a second. Go ahead, Brad. Mark, you may need a hug. Okay, so the sphere... It looks to me that the sphere is covering more ground than the, than the P orbitals, but the P orbitals have more energy than the larger sphere. Okay, so, so when you the say... The field doesn't reflect on how much energy... The volume of the probability field does not reflect on how much energy the orbitals have. I have to admit I'm not quite sure where you're going. Okay. So I look at the sphere, just, just look at the sphere, okay. the larger yellow sphere, the big one. Okay. That's covering more volume. Can we call it the 2S? Yes. Okay. The 2S is covering more volume of probability than the 2P is in this picture. Okay. Okay. So let, let, me, let me try this back at you, Brandon. Are, are you thinking that the volume of the sphere is an, is an indication of its probability. Is that what you're going to? 
Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about you, too, yeah. Mister. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But remember, but remember that, 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 that negative R sub H over N squared square is not, not a function that predicts probability. probability. It's, a it's a function that predicts energy. energy. So, just so just because that goes, goes to zero doesn't mean there is zero probability of electrons. There is zero probability of electrons, but it's not described by that equation. Because... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Wrong Oh, gotcha. Wrong equation. Never... Yes, you're good. Oh, I, I heard that wrong. Tyler, what do you think? Yes. Exactly. So what if it's interesting? I've never I've never had a class go here, but it sounds like many of you are trying to make sense of what it means that these volumes are different. I mean, we see that there's a 1s and then a 2s, and we're comfortable with those differences in volume. Um, but then we start to incorporate the 2p, and it sounds like some of you are even trying to think, if I could calculate the volume of that and then multiply that by 3, because there's three orbitals, how would that compare to the overall volume of the 2s sphere? Yes. Okay. And, and the answer... <laughs> It's sobering to think I'm now thinking on Brandon's wavelengths. Um, so, no, it's I love it. I love it. I love it. So, guys, here here's the here's the deal. Um, there's nothing to be learned from that. There there is not an important underlying mystery about about these relative volumes of three times the p bigger than the s or smaller than the s or whatever. But we will say this, that as these atoms get more and more complex, forgive me for saying it this way, but they'd really like more volume, right? Because what did these electrons do to each other? They interfere with each other. So guys, understand that, yeah, these are pretty little dots on the screen, but in a very real way, these electrons are all influencing each other. And the 1s's are pushing on the 2s's, and the 2s's are pushing on the 2p's. And what, what we're really also experiencing here is a resolution of tension. That the, when, if, if a 1s and a 2s get too close, then there's going to be an increase in energy because of the repulsion that exists between those electrons. And so what happens is, is these electrons are, are in, in, fall, or in occupying, if you will, these, these wave-like volumes. What they're actually doing is they're creating a structure that minimizes repulsion and therefore energy. And so the 2s is bigger than the 1s because the 2s has to be bigger because the 1s electrons are already there. And if they're already there, the 2s electrons won't let them in because they repel. So the 2s electrons have to be in a, big, a bigger volume. And then those 2p electrons have also got to be in a slightly bigger volume because of the repulsion of the 1s and the 2s. So as we see these changing and morphing volumes, Volumes, what we're really seeing is a resolution of repulsion. Go ahead. So just looking at the 1s and the 2s. Okay. The 1s is a tiny sphere inside of it, and the 2s is a bigger sphere around it. Correct. So can the electrons in the 2s orbital not ever be in the tiny sphere in the middle? No, they can be in there. Yeah, no, 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 because remember that these are regions of highest probability. So let's pretend instead of where they probably are, let's pretend it's where they always are. So can a 1s electron be in the 2s? Not likely, 
But can a 2S be in the 1S? Oh, yeah, you bet. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. But understand that if this 2S electron moves into the 1S, that's going to influence where the 1S electrons go. And guys, if you're not following the conversation, understand that's what made Schrodinger's equations so powerful and yet ridiculously hard to solve. Because now what we're talking about is equations that describe all these really complex interactions as one thing pushes on another. It gets literally very chaotic very quickly. Yeah. Um, we go ahead. Yes, that's a good term, probability field. Yeah, yeah. You have like an electron, say like the very top of that. So if we've got an electron here. So where the electron is here. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we, we could say it this way. The immediate location of an electron in the 1S limits the probability of where electrons can be in, I'm sorry, let's say you said 2P. So the, the immediate location of an electron in the 2P limits the probability of where the electrons can be in the 2S. Yeah, they absolutely influence each other. And, 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 and for every electron that's in a system, like in neon, there's 10 simultaneously. And each of those 10 simultaneously is limiting the simultaneous choices of all the other electrons. And eventually, with, with 10 choices and multiple possibilities, you end up with things that look like this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You got it. Guys, I'm going to give you just these two and then we're done. Go ahead, Rebecca. We need to move forward. Yeah. So, when there's a 1S and 2S, you have a 2P sublevel. Does that make it the probability of finding something in 2S more likely because it's like a more likely thing that's part of the space? I don't know if it's more likely, but it will change. It'll change the probability. I don't know if it's better or worse, but it will, it will impact the probability of all the other functions. Yeah, yeah. So guys, crazy, right? So let's keep going. So now let's go to the third energy level. And guys, you know from last year that the third energy level has got three sublevels, S, P, D, and F. S is two, P is six, D is, sorry, S, P, D is 10. And guys, as you would expect, the, the D sublevel has five orbitals. But now these orbitals are more complex than the P. Why? Why would the P be more complex? Why would the D be more complex than the P? We need more probabilities because we've got more electrons and we need more choices for spaces because of all the interference. And that's the magic of Schrodinger's equations. He predicted using those wave equations that that would be true and now we're finding that it is. It makes sense logically, it makes sense mathematically, and then through experimentation, it's proving to be true physically. So now let's go to the fourth energy level. Remember this? Fourth energy level, how many sublevels? Four, S, P, D, and F. And then, guys, we found out about this disturbing little overlap, right? So what does it mean? What does it mean that the 4S fills before the 3D? What do you now know about the 4S relative to the 3D? Less energy. Now, guys, let's talk about why. Why would the 4S, because the 4S is in a, technically in a higher energy level. Why would the 4S have less energy than the 3D? Well, first of all, notice what's happening. These are closing in on each other. So the energy difference between the third and fourth energy level is not that much to begin with. But now what about this? 
What does the 4S look like? It's a big old sphere. And guys, spheres are easy. You want to blow a bubble. If you blow a soap bubble, guess what it's going to look like? A sphere. Guys, why does nature tend towards spheres? Because spheres are very low energy structures. They're easy. What is the D, what is the uh, 3D look like? Stinking madness, right? We just looked at it. It's crazy. It's It's this. Guys, this is not simple. And simple is hard. Simple is high energy. And so it turns out that actually a large sphere is lower energy than these Ds because these Ds are all mucky mucked up and they've got all these crazy shapes. And because, thank you Gibbs, things always happen that are the easiest, it's easier for electrons to occupy the 4S than the 3D and that fills first. And then it goes on from there and we've got the P's and the D's and the F's and the F's I don't even know if I've got the F's in here. Uh, I don't, but they're a mess. Okay, so guys, with all of that then, and we are almost out of time, this is where this became practical. Because you may remember then that we had this magic moment. And we learned that we now have some understandings that the S sublevel has two, the P is six, the D is 10, and the F is 14 electrons. And then we realize that on the periodic table, we have a space that relates to two and six and 10 and 14. And we realize that the periodic table is structured after this very pattern. 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p. This is the structure that the periodic table has put together. Now, when Mendeleev put the periodic table together in the 1840s, did he know 1s, 2s, 2p? Amazing coincidence? No. How did Mendeleev put the periodic table together? The way they react. But guys, doesn't that make sense? What determines the way elements react? They're electrons. And when you put elements together in rows based upon their electron structures, that naturally follows 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, because it's those very same electrons in these sublevels that determine the way the elements react. Isn't that cool? And so, guys, what we found out then is that this order, 1s, 2s, 2p, and so on, is on the periodic table. You've got 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p, 6s, 5d, 4f, and so on. And we were, from that, able to figure out the electron structures for atoms. Now, guys, um, I wasn't planning on spending more time on that with you, although I will warn you about this. When you add or remove electrons to make ions, where do those electrons come from or go into? the highest S and P sublevels. Do you remember that? Should we do one of these really quickly? Okay, so guys, this is the idea. You can flip that paper over if you'd like an example. So guys, let's do this. Let's do copper because it just came to my mind. So guys, what is the electron structure of copper? Um, yeah, let's, no. I don't want to do copper. I want to do, no. Let's do this. Let's do silver. Guys, let's take a look at silver. Oops, I'm writing in white. So guys, silver is AG. And what we're going to do is we're going to do the noble gas abbreviation for this element. So when we do the noble gas abbreviation, what we do is we go back to the previous noble gas. So silver takes us back to krypton. So we go like this. And krypton covers everything up through the end of the 4P 
with 36 electrons. Now, in addition to that, to get to silver, we start with electrons 37 and 38. And where are electrons 37 and 38? They're in the 5s, and there are two of them. We'll talk. Then, guys, when we continue to silver, we're now in the D, but it's not the 5D, it's the 4D, and we go... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this is four D nine. So um so this would be I'm ignoring questions, just listen. Guys, this would be the electron structure of silver. Now let's do this. What if we want to give this silver a negative one charge? No, you can't. Because guys, the electrons can only go into or out of the highest S and or P sublevel. What's the name we give those? valence electrons, you can't mess around with the D sublevel. So now let's talk about why. Why can't you mess around with the Ds? They're tucked underneath the S. Don't miss this, Rebecca. They have lower energy than the S. And in the same way that if you want to add a layer of clothing, you always do it from the outside in. And if you want to shed clothes, it's from the outside out. Because you can only mess around with the outside. And so if you want to add or remove electrons, it's never from the Ds or the Fs because they're never valence. So if you want to add an electron to silver, where does it go? You can't. Now what if you want to take away an electron and make it silver plus one? What do you do? Where do you take the electron from? The S, so we would take that away and it would become 5s1. I'm still ignoring questions. Knock it off. It's 5s149. You get the idea? Does that make sense? You're okay? And that, yeah, so if we wanted to do silver plus one, we would do this. We would take away one electron from here and, and this would be silver plus one. Okay? Now, guys, what about this? What if we wanted to go silver plus two. So if we wanted to go silver plus two, what do we do? Take away how many electrons? Two. Where do we take them away from? The S. And so we would get rid of these. And guys, if you do that, you could put 5S zero. You could put 5S blank. Just don't erase the 5S. Okay? You okay with that? Okay, now let's talk about all you that are raising your hands, Mr. Smarty Pantses. No, I'm going to lead. Guys, look at, look at silver on the periodic table. Oh, you can't. If you have a good, if you have our other periodic table, guys, we've got some problems. If you look at silver on the periodic table, there's a little number above silver that tells you the charges it can take on, and the only number there is one. Guys, silver can only go plus one. Silver cannot go plus two. And now you're going, why? It's got two valence electrons. Why can't we take them both? Well, guys, the answer is this. Silver does not have two valence electrons. It only has one. And here's what happens. This is the orbital filling diagram for the tail end of silver. Stay put. But guys, this is not what silver actually looks like. Here's what happens. One of these electrons jumps out of the S sublevel into the D sublevel. You will see this reflected on your periodic table. The electron structure of silver is actually krypton 4s1, I'm sorry, 5s1, 4d10. Why does it do this? Why does everything happen? It's easier. Guys, it turns out that this atom is more stable 
with a partially filled S and a totally filled D than it is with a totally filled S and a D that doesn't have any ordered structure. So guys, silver actually loses an electron from the S into the D, and that explains why silver can only be plus one. So now you're saying to yourself, how on earth am I supposed to remember that? If you are only going to give me this periodic table, how am I supposed to know that? And guys, the answer is you're not. You need to know the electron structures by the trends. Doesn't mean they can't ask you, why can silver only go plus one? Because you can think your way through it, but they would never ask you, draw the electron structure for silver. Do you see the difference? They won't ask you to predict this, but they may ask you to explain it. Do you see the difference? Okay, so guys, here's where we are. Um, homework goes like this. Here's your homework. And guys, we are going to grade this on Monday and we're going to do PES on Monday and your test will be on Wednesday. Now guys, relative to pride, we are basing pride on first quarter's grades, which are solidified and there's nothing we can do. So guys, I hope that I was able to reach out to a couple students that I need to talk to during pride. So you're free to go. Um, when you've got this written down, take care, have a good weekend. Yeah. Oh yeah, guys, do you want, should I just give them to you next week? Okay, I'll, oh, wait a sec. Actually, no, I'm gonna give them to you Tuesday because we need to talk, Monday, we need to talk. Have a good weekend, you guys.